All right, so today's presentation is going to be retitled Way Beyond Micromobility and Way Beyond Bike Lanes. Um, and so um, we're sorry for the false advertising in the, in the thing, but what we want to do is we want to put this all in context. Um, I'm Kelly Coiner. I'm the Mobility Innovation Lead at Stantec, which um, is a large architecture and engineering firm based in Canada. And um, my colleagues um, mostly scratched their heads when I told them I was coming to talk about scooters and autonomous vehicles, but they know I'll take any excuse to talk about autonomous vehicles. Um, and scooters really have a lot to do with what we need to be doing with autonomous vehicles in the sense of sort of how do we look at these challenging disruptive technologies in the public space? How do we manage them? How do we govern them? How do we make sure that we get all the values that we want? Health, happiness, safety, um, transparency, efficiency, and mobility. And my job at, at uh, at Stantec is to help us take technologies and integrate them in ways that accomplish all of those goals. Um, I promise I wouldn't go long on introductions, and so I'm going to tell you I'm joined here by um, colleagues that have been, some of them have been uh, colleagues have been for a long time um, and some for shorter periods of time, but all only virtually um, in terms of the work that we've done together. Brad Davis, who's with Alta Planning and Design and is based in Florida and has really been a leader in thinking about what is new mobility and how does it work in the urban context. And Rutt is, um, has the best name consultancy ever, which is Understanding Disruption. <laughs> Um, and he's based in Denver and is focused on things from the AV perspective. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to have um, some really, hopefully really brief and provocative um, presentations. We're going to pause after each of them for questions. Um, but we, we really want to engage with you and to continue the conversation over the course of the entire hour, which is why I was annoying and started on time. Uh, Brad, the mic is yours. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today I'm gonna talk uh, about um, some terms, just so that we're all on the same page, and then give you some ideas about uh, how we can rethink street design uh, with all of this new technology um, coming online. Um, but before I go into the presentation, I like starting with this image. It's a real image, but I've highlighted this guy. And I feel like we can all relate to how he feels. Not quite ready to let go of our uh, mode of transportation that we know, but willing to try some type of new technology like a scooter. Uh, and this picture is actually taken in Charlotte, in downtown, across from their main uh, transit center. Uh, and as you can see, it is really not designed for people riding bikes or on scooters, but he's going along the street anyway. And the land use context around it, even though it's right in the heart of downtown, is still largely auto-oriented. Um, and so when we think about new mobility and scooters, uh, we also have to think about the context in which they're operating and all of the different uses uh, in a particularly urban environment. So first, some terms. So new mobility, or sometimes people say future mobility, uh, but uh, for our purposes, it's transportation services that are enabled, defined, or redefined by digital technology. So then kind of paring it down a little bit more to what we're talking about today, oftentimes there's shared mobility, uh, and that can mean a shared use of a vehicle, whether a car, a motorcycle, a scooter, a bicycle, or some other mode for short-term access. And then, paring down even more, micromobility, which NACTO has defined as all shared use fleets of small, full, or partially human-powered vehicles such as bikes, e-bikes, and e-scooters. And so it's starting to change the way people get around in our communities. Um, and so just to kind of give some examples and kind of expand the aperture a little bit, you know, shared vehicles, it's things like, you know, e-bikes or bike sharing or 
e-bike, bike sharing, you know, there's lots of gray overlap with all of these e-scooters or scooter sharing or car share. Uh, but I think it's important to make the distinction between some of those with types of trips. So, that, you know, shared trips with ride sharing or ride hailing or microtransit. Um, there's all different types of mixing and matching that goes on. And just in terms to highlight the growth of micromobility, it's a very obviously recent phenomenon, but you know, bike share was really first introduced in the US um, in 2010. And it's had you know, slow but steady progression, largely through uh, municipal uh, investment. But then in 2017, there was some disruption with dockless bike share. Uh, and then came 2018 with the flood of scooters that had almost matched the number of rides uh, for bike share last year. Uh, so significant growth um, and meaningful growth in terms of the number of trips that are getting uh, generated with this new technology. Um, and while we aren't talking about freight delivery today, I do just want to highlight it. We use this as a bit of tongue-in-cheek image to think about the future of streets with drones and bots delivering our groceries or that book we needed same day, um, competing for space on the street. And so we'll talk a little bit about um, you know, how we maybe organize this in a way that um, keeps streets uh, um, working well and safe. So how many of you have heard the term complete streets? I'm assuming a lot of you have. Um, so you know, it's been around for a long time, and just a traditional uh, kind of definition of complete streets is that it means that there is access and mobility for everyone, regardless of age, mobility, or mode. That it's unique in the sense that it's, um, the road design is in context with the surrounding land use and area. It's balanced so that it's not auto-centric, but provides a high degree of transportation options for everyone, back to that, that first point. It's safe, and in particular, it prioritizes the needs of the most vulnerable road users, so oftentimes that's pedestrians, but that can also mean a wider range of, of people um, uh, walking, biking, or using some other mode. And it's comprehensive in the sense that you're not just thinking about that particular street in isolation, but you're thinking about it in terms of an overall network. You know, it's not very helpful to have a bike lane in your neighborhood, but when you get to the edge of your neighborhood to a major street, there's no bike infrastructure, or you just want to cross to the other side, you likely aren't going to ride your bike because it might not feel safe or comfortable, you or you know, with a you know, family member. So with this new technology, there's some additional things or tweaks to those original principles that we've been incorporated into how we think about street design. So things like prioritizing uses in different ways or maybe uh, at a more granular level. The focus on safety is still a significant one, but with some changes, like for example, you know, scooters, whether they are allowed to operate on the sidewalk or not. Point-to-point um, -point trips are now more of a thing rather than thinking that you would take your bike to a destination or a car and then bring it back. Uh, expanding the, <clears throat> excuse me, the number of options um, in terms of multimodalism, complete networks, both in terms of physical as well as digital infrastructure. Uh, and these last two are really enabled by technology in terms of adaptability, so changing based on demand for, say, time of day or for particular events, and then also being able to measure uh, outcomes. Uh, we have a lot more data that's being generated by these new technologies and are able, if we can get access to some of the data, can really inform uh, decision making about how we um, plan for the transportation future in the communities where we work. So in terms of application, you know, one way to think about it is the clustering of um, you know, services at a mobility hub. So you can think of that maybe at like a transit station or a bus stop where in addition to having transit service, you might have some of these other services available, scooters, uh, bike share, or digital infrastructure you know, built into a stop or station. Uh, but you can also think about it spread and distributed in different ways. And so maybe thinking about you know, the middle um, horizontal line, think of that as maybe a main street. And you have some restaurants and some businesses along there, has a popular nightlife, 
Um, and so you have maybe lots of competition to use that one street um, by Uber Eats and people going out for dinner and um, other folks needing to make deliveries or pickups from some of the businesses. And so you could think about maybe distributing some of the demand in different places. So maybe you know, Uber Eats has a designated area one block north of Main Street, and maybe uh, ride hailing you know, services have to pick up and drop off um, on a side street, for example. And so there's a lot more flexibility in the network design that you can have using the new technology that's available. So just some ideas to give you um, some things to think about with street design. This is a, a one-way street just for illustrative purposes. Uh, but as typical, you have a sidewalk, you have you know, some separation between the sidewalk and on-street parking. You have three travel lanes and the same on the other side. And with a traditional kind of application of complete streets, oftentimes what you would get would be this change where you would maybe remove a travel lane and get you know, maybe a bike lane or buffered bike lane, maybe taking out some on-street parking so that you aren't taking away any vehicular capacity along the street. But uh, I took this photo this morning on L Street on the way over in the bike lane and <laughs> I feel like from the chuckles, you can kind of get where I'm going with it, is that while it's, it's good and you need to have that dedicated space, um, it's not, it, we need to go further in thinking about how we manage particularly the curbside. Um, because it is a legitimate thing to have um, you know, space for folks to do deliveries, particularly in an urban environment. And so um, thinking about Complete Streets 2.0, thinking more in terms of mode, in terms of speed of users and vehicles, the person capacity, and then the demand. Um, and so here's one example, just thinking about the um, sidewalk space, still keeping that clear, but kind of enhancing it with more space or dedicated space for um, uh, dockless you know, bike share or scooters or activating it with some type of public space uh, amenities uh, for restaurants or other economic activity or simply to enjoy, you know, the street. Um, but one thing we've been thinking about is going beyond just calling something a bike lane and saying maybe it's for personal mobility ways. And so it would accommodate all things going at similar speeds. So in addition to, um, you know, people um, biking, it can have people on the electric skateboards, it can have people on all the different types of new technologies that are going roughly the same speed but are uh, not large vehicles. Uh, and then, you know, in the middle, you can have a, a separation, a physical separation, like a median that allows for additional activity with a high capacity vehicular lane that would maybe accommodate uh, either transit or other types of um, services that require frequent stops, such as the delivery truck that I just highlighted, or space for uh, a transit stop so it's not conflicting with people biking or using the sidewalk, um, or other types of uses that might be able to fit in there. Uh, and then lastly, you know, then thinking about travel lane that maybe has the least person capacity uh, along that street. And so you can see we went from almost all of the real estate along the street dedicated to moving vehicles to a much more balanced street that is oriented towards a wide range of users and uses. Um, Go for it. All right. <clears throat> so. Um, this is, there, there are two main issues that I'm trying to address with this talk, and one is the issue of safety, and, uh, and it is a serious issue for cyclists and for scooters as well. But the other one is the issue of this coming explosion of these small delivery vehicles. There are so many companies that are working on these things, and they're coming from all directions. There are billions of dollars that are going into this area. And just like in our cities, we didn't really do a very good job of anticipating scooters. I don't see many cities that are really thinking through what the impact of these small delivery vehicles is, is going to be. So I want to 
uh, put out some ideas on that. In 2016, 840 cyclists were killed in America on our streets. That's a, that's a lot of deaths, and um, a lot of that was in the urban communities. And when you've got a, a 40 mile per hour, two ton vehicle right next to, right adjacent to a 30 pound bike going about 50 miles an hour, you've got a problem. And so that's kind of fundamental to how we've been doing a lot of our bike lanes. So how do we do something about that? Well, if you look at, at why people, more people don't cycle, the number one concern that they expressed was this, this half of them said being hit by a car was their, was their big worry. And, and I was just visiting my nephew and he lives 15 minutes from the campus on a bike and he won't bike because one of their professors was almost killed, came very close to death by a truck's, by a truck's mirror basically catching him on a bike. So, so a lot more people, if we could create these physical separations, we could get more people on bikes. And frankly, bike lanes carry a lot of people compared to single occupancy vehicles. The one point is that, uh, that I want to make there is, is it is not sufficient just to paint the lane green. Green paint is not a solution to this problem. This is NACTO's Urban Bikeway Design Guide. And in this, they've got parking, and then next to that in between, they've got a bike lane, and then they've got cars going by with the little white paint stripe. <coughs> uh, it retains the curbside parking, and it avoids a lot of the political pushback that you get, but it really doesn't do much for safety. So here's case two, a curbside bark lane, bike lane, but the parking moved over. One of the challenges you have here is people getting out of these cars are not first turning around and looking behind them and seeing if there's a bike approaching. They're just swinging their doors open. And so you can easily get, get doored by a, by a car in this. And those people have to move across the bike lane in order to get to their car. And so you're, you're also, in almost all of these models, you have the problem with people turning. And we'll look at later what's the, what the Dutch are doing about that challenge. So here's another one. These are flex posts. And cars won't generally try to run through these flex posts and if they're sober or their drivers are reasonably sober. But, uh, but they are somewhat of a, of a break. And, and it's better than just white paint, but it doesn't really get you there. So let's look at a few other options. Traffic barriers like this are really quite effective. The problem with the traffic barriers is they take a fair amount of space, not so much, but they're expensive to build, and, and they're a real challenge to maintain, especially if you've got them planted. So, um, and in this case, you're also losing the parking. So dedicated dual micro-mobility lanes, that's really terrific. But how do you get the right-of-ways for those things? If you're doing greenfield development, this is really one of the first things you, could think, you should think about. Because it also gives enough space to have, uh, have scooters and bikes sharing space without necessarily killing each other. But, um, but this is, uh, if, you, if you're greenfield, this is something that's really worth thinking about. Construction costs are high, but hopefully these things are going to be used for a very long time. So I want to show this video. Mostly because if you look at our deaths on bicycles, 30% of those are at street junctions, at intersections. And the Dutch have given a lot of thought of, to this, and this, was, this is one of their solutions. This is a standard US road from the latest urban design guide with the official lane widths. And this is the latest advice for a cycle lane with a right turning lane. The problem with this design is the extremely bad angle of crossing. A driver has to look over his or her right shoulder to see if there's someone on a bicycle. For that reason, the Dutch stopped building lanes like this a long time ago. They keep cyclists to the right of motorized traffic and deal with the crossing on the junction itself. To make that possible in a safe way, you can create an extra curb to connect the cycle lanes on both streets. It has the same radius as the existing curb and cars should turn around the cycle path anyway. You can see there's now room for a protecting traffic island. When we open the curb to let cyclists go straight on, we see that we have created a cycle path on the junction itself without needing more space. There's room for this in every corner. To make things more clear for all road users, we could add some color. 
and at the place of crossing, some markings. Now we only have to find a new place for pedestrians to cross the street. For that, we can easily shift back the stopping line a bit, add a zebra crossing, and pedestrians have an even better place to cross the street. Now how does this improve safety? A right-turning car has to stop here, while someone on a bike waits over here, in very clear view of the driver. A cyclist will be gone once the car arrives at the crossing place, but if they do meet there, eye contact is possible because both can look to the front. This design solves a further problem, that of the left turn. You may think this could only work in theory, but this is standard design for Dutch junctions. It really needs no more space than a traditional junction, but for people cycling, it is much safer and it makes riding a lot more pleasant. So there are a lot of good ideas that are all around the world. I, I think one thing we don't always do very well is best practices study. Look at what the rest of the world and, and what other places are doing. Uh, and that uh, addresses one of our most dangerous places in cycling. So I want to talk about delivery robots and just give you an idea of how much of this is actually happening now. Uh, there, there's a lot of money going into this uh, and a lot of little startups and, uh, and we really need to think it through. We need to think through what opportunities it might create as well for us. So here are some of the larger ones, uh, starting with the Neuro here. The Neuro is actually only about 3.6 feet wide, but it is a delivery vehicle. I've seen these in Arizona, uh, basically doing deliveries from Fry's Grocery down there, and, and they're pretty, pretty slick. They just did a second round capital raise of $960 million to bring these things to market. So Neolix and, and Baidu in China, uh, Baidu is like the Amazon of China, are also uh, coming out with, uh, with these delivery, same sort of delivery vehicles, as is Stop and Shop in conjunction with Robomart. There's a store that basically comes to your house. And, uh, and in Estonia, all the, way, all the way over in Estonia, they're doing large package delivery with a, a larger scale, uh, somewhat larger scale drone. And then in kind of the medium size, these are examples of of some of the companies that are coming out with these. If you look at the one in the center, it's kind of interesting because it comes with its own storage unit. If you're subscribing to this service, they have a, a little storage unit that they put in your yard and it comes up, opens, pushes the packages out, closes the doors, locks both doors and takes off. And so nobody can lift your package from your doorstep. In the, in the bottom left is a mothership. That's, that's a Starship Mercedes down there. And the idea of this is they load these small delivery vehicles, so instead of having these things going a mile down your, down your sidewalks, it drops them off along the way near where their deliveries are going to be. They make the deliveries, and then it picks them up later on. And then here's, you know, here's a uh, few. The one on the top is from DHL. PepsiCo snack fleet, uh, all these little different smaller, uh, smaller units. The problem is, it, during lunchtime, if you have all these things running around the streets, as you can see from here, imagine 10 times as many of these robots on our, on our uh, sidewalks. It's just, if you think scooters are bad, these are going to be worse. But it also creates an opportunity, and, and this is part of that idea. These are, these are what are called sleds. Okay, sleds are basically the drivetrain of an electric vehicle. And on that, you can load a lot of packages or you can load a lot of these small robots. And you might have locations around the city where essentially they, there is some equipment to pull the small robots off or that could be built into the back of the sled. This is a front view of one that's carrying delivery autonomous vehicles and a side view of one that's just carrying boxes, packages. And with the one that's carrying packages, you might have locations where they're little, if you want to call them airports of these, of these small drone copters that when you get near there, it meets the truck, pulls these packages off and delivers them to the, 
to the end user or very near the end user. I know that it all sounds a little far-fetched. There are a lot of very imaginative people out there that are trying to find new and creative solutions to get around what they foresee as this problem of excessive numbers of these vehicles. So flex post here uh, and, and cable uh, post barriers are both interesting ideas to incorporate into the concept of having a lane that is dedicated to delivery vehicles. So if you look at those sleds that we just looked at, imagine if you had, rather than just throwing those out into regular traffic, they're four feet wide or so, and you basically could run them in a narrow lane. And let me show you what the narrow lane looks like. Here you have sidewalks on both sides, but if you look on the right, you'll see the rumble strip and two-way two bike lane, and that's about 11 feet that you wind up having to dedicate to that. So that's like a full lane that you're giving up, but you're getting two-way bikes on that. And if you drift across that rumble strip, strip, like you see on the edge of highways, let you know that you need to be in your lane. And then next to that are, is this delivery autonomous vehicle carriers, these sleds, but also autonomous vehicle shuttles. Because some of these shuttles vehicles are actually fairly narrow. And so you have a lane there, and between that lane and all of the uh, car lanes, you have basically a cable post barrier. And then between the bikes, you don't want to have a cable post barrier between that and the AVs. Because one thing about autonomous vehicles is they can lane keep within an inch. And so these vehicles will be traveling straight down the middle of that lane. And if you've got a cable post that those drivers are seeing, they're not gonna drift into that lane very easily. And all you need are flex posts, so if there is an accident with a, with a cyclist, they don't necessarily run into the, uh, into the uh, vehicles, but uh, they're not going to run into that lane casually either. And then over on the side to keep the pedestrians, you don't want someone jaywalking across eight lanes of traffic and vehicles. And, and so I put a cable post over there with just a single wire barrier across it. Over on the far side, there's a parking lane. So you can preserve parking, but you might also think about the idea of using a lane like that for autonomous vehicles that are platooning. I don't know how familiar you are with platooning, but in platooning, you can have like a, a car length or less between these vehicles, and because they're communicating with each other and because they're able to respond in a thousandth of a second when the front one speeds up, slows down, brakes, or whatever else, they can actually travel in you can get about, in my calculations, about eight times the number of people traveling in those lanes as you can with just conventional lanes. So those are some ideas. We got a long way to go here, but we also have a lot of people that are dying on bicycles. And a lot of people that are dying on, are, are getting seriously injured on scooters. We really are gonna have to rethink how we dedicate this, but we gotta do it in a way where we recognize that road surface is a resource for a city. And they're not gonna give up very many feet in that road, road source easily. Part of this is you might squeeze a lot of the room for, these, uh, for this autonomous vehicle, that five feet that's in there, by making those other lanes a little more narrow, which slows traffic to some degree, but also has a lot of benefits. Do we need 11 foot wide lanes in, in all of our cities? And that's it, thank you. My motivation for spending so much time on autonomous vehicles and working on them is to make transportation work better. And I've spent 30 years trying to solve the problem of human beings as drivers and bicyclists and pedestrians. And um, I'm kind of tired of it. And so my real interest is in how do we make things much safer. Um, this slide is from two years ago, and it's on a very old street. It's in New Orleans where we did a demonstration there. Not a place that's gonna be particularly susceptible to putting in three new lanes. But I think this illustrates a couple of really key things that are, I think are essential in terms of thinking about where autonomy and all its different forms fits into a complete street, whether it's in, his, in the historic French Quarter um, or it's in an area where we have an opportunity to make new investments. And I don't really want to repeat the wonderful things that my colleague said, so I thought I would focus on three things that I think I bring that are distinct to this. The first 
um, is thinking about and understanding what this technology is and how it relates to bicycles. Another is to talk a little bit about how a lot of the things that we already know about pedestrian and bicycle safety are equally applicable in the street now. It isn't about the autonomous vehicle. In fact, we find that bicycles are more comfortable around autonomous vehicles because they're predictable and human drivers are not. And then thirdly, I want to talk about sort of the direction of the change because this is, when we talk about designing for micro-mobility and bike lanes, these are things that are here now. They're, the technology is here now and the opportunities on the infrastructure are here now. With respect to the technology, I always think it's pretty interesting. I, I almost routinely get a question of saying, well, how does an autonomous vehicle decide to hit a bicyclist or to hit a pedestrian or hit another car? And um, I'm like, yeah, well, that's an interesting question. How does a human being decide to hit one of those things? Well, the difference is that with an autonomous vehicle, it's not about being programmed to hit a particular thing. It's about what are the different kinds of technology that influence the decision making in the, in the vehicle. One is object classification. It's the use of cameras on vehicles that then uses artificial intelligence to distinguish what's going on. It's true that bicyclists and bikes and pedestrians are among the hardest AI problems in the city workspace, but here's the good news. Other sensors don't really care what you are, they just make the vehicle stop. Um, if you're using LiDAR, pixelation, or the like, the it doesn't really care if you're a pillar or you're a pedestrian, the vehicle stops in a low speed environment, that's a, another sort of particularly important um, situation. Most vehicles, whether they're slow speed vehicles or higher speed vehicles, don't rely on one kind of sensor. They rely on multiple kinds of sensors. So I think it's really essential when we approach this question that everybody have a basic level of technology understanding. Am I a technologist? No, but I taught one of the first um, courses at the graduate level on AV planning and policy, and I spent the first four weeks on a really deep dive on all the technological questions about AI, about the sensors and the like, and I think that it's a responsibility of all of us as planners and policymakers to understand how the technology works in the current environment. Um, the second thing is that this is, um, there's, you know, there's sort of that sort of expression that there's nothing new. And when it comes to bicycle and pedestrian safety, um, what is not new is that we know that separating fast movie heavy vehicles from bicyclists and pedestrians is really, really important. And there are lots of ways that we can do this, but that it's not about the kind of vehicle it is or who's moving it, it's that it's a big, heavy vehicle that you are not going to win that fight when you come against it. And so that is sort of a fundamental sort of principle that we need to think about in terms of looking at how the urban space works. The other one is if we have a philosophical um, and a, and a deep-seated value about having environments where all these modes can thrive people can walk places, that they can enjoy active transportation. That doesn't change when we introduce autonomous vehicles to the situation. Instead, we need to design for the autonomous vehicle, whether it is a scooter that's becoming autonomous, or it's one of these shuttles, or it's a grocery store drone that's moving through that environment. And then the third thing is to talk a little bit about the pace of change. It's not linear, for one thing, and one of the things that makes it not linear has nothing to do with Moore's law and how much faster processing goes. It has to do with the kinds of choices that, that we make and the ways that we move forward. It's also not linear because it's not just about technology. It's about these dramatic changes in service models, about digital movement of mobility. Um, one of the things that fascinates me about dockless bikes and scooters is how quickly things change, both how they start and then how they make an abrupt stop and then how they move in another direction. These are also um, indicators that there are levers that we can use to make things differently. One is that we can think about how we govern where and when these are used, and that is not only 
an issue of what the infrastructure looks like, but also the digital infrastructure. How do we geofence things? How do we condition the use of the streets by these vendors um, on certain practices um, and the like? But one of the, the really fascinating things to me is the ways in which we might see autonomy roll out. A lot of times people think about, oh, it's a long way away. Um, and that's based on current vehicle ownership patterns of everybody having their own car and the fleet replacement that happens with that as we replace each and every one of those cars. It's true that we wouldn't see significant deployment of autonomous vehicles until 2050. But in reality, that's not how it's happening. It's happening in a shared context. It's happening with slow vehicles. It's happening in ways to sort of accelerate accessibility. It's blurring the lines between freight and passengers and how they work. There's your imagination um, should run wild in thinking about sort of what these applications are. But one of the value choices we can make is to value shared use of these vehicles, to put the finger on the scale for shared ownership and for shared use and how it integrates into the total environment that we're talking about. So what does she mean when she says that and what difference would it make? Well, the most interesting um, kinds of studies that have been done on this are looking at the ways in which we could have uh, put the finger on the scale for these small sorts of vehicles to be used in densely populated areas. And they may not be a particularly densely populated urban area. It may be a densely populated node in a rural community where there's a need for a lot of movement. But the prediction there is that if we take the steps that encourage these sort of choices, that we make it efficient for things to move. Because one of the things is that that lane that we talk about having automated vehicles in or we have um, shuttles that are microtransit in needs to move quickly in order to be used frequently. If we make those sorts of steps, um, the predictions are that we could, in densely populated areas, we could see a drop of car ownership by 70% by 2035. And 2035 is not that far away. So just think about what a difference that would make in that environment. How about some questions? So, yeah, quick question. I'm a community development director from a, a mid-sized city in California that um, doesn't really have the density for, I think, the, the automated bot delivery, nor do we have the transit network yet to um, really be cutting you know, 16, 20 feet out of the, the right of way for vehicles, still very much auto dependent. What do you say to cities like that that sort of believe in the direction but just aren't there yet in terms of being able to um, you know, cut back on uh, just standard automobile throughput at this point? Is, it, is there a phased approach or what are your thoughts on that? Um, I, think it, I think it's very much uh, designing with a particular community in mind, but there are two cities that um, I and my colleagues are working in right now that sort of meet that. And I might even be, um, it'd be interesting to know where you are in California because we're working in some California cities as well. Irvine in, in Irvine. Orange County. Yeah, I'm not working in Irvine yet, but would love to. Um, but I've worked in Bloomington, Indiana, um, which is, as a university campus environment, has actually a fairly robust transit system and campus transportation system. Um, and they asked us to come in and look at how do you integrate and build out more options in other places and then how do you restore walkability in the core of the city, which also happens to be adjacent to the core of the campus. And um, what I'd say is that you, you look differently at what the, um, you know, what the opportunities are to use maybe, may not be widening a particular area, but it's reclaiming the curbside and managing the curbside is probably the biggest answer in those sort of congested areas. The second one is one where I'm not there today because I'm here, but we kicked off um, work in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which interestingly is considered one of the top 10 AV ready and AV trip worthy cities to look at. Um, and I like to think about AVs across a continuum from you know, the sort of low-level technologies, but also integrated into the rest of it. 
And the kinds of things I would say there is, think about what your trip mix is. Think about what's unique about what's in your, your particular environment and find the places that will begin to, that are at the intersection of economic development of your congestion points in those environments. And don't, don't try to become New York City um, in terms of what the, um, there are a lot of reasons not to become New York City, but, um, but in terms of what that transportation um, environment looks like. And then the other one I would mention actually is right across the river here, which is where I got my start working on AVs, which is Crystal City, which is now known as Natural Landing, um, code name for Amazon HQ2. And there we're looking a lot at how do we take the next set of investments that are going to be made in infrastructure so that we can create a three-mile walk zone, the diameter, mile-and-a-half walk zone in that, that area as well. So there are lots of different ones. I hogged the mic on this one. Go for it. <laughs> so you had expressed surprise or concern that governments aren't doing more to accommodate AVs and getting out in front of that. But if you go back, it wasn't all that long ago when Betamax and VHS was happening, right? So you showed a lot of different sizes and types of vehicles. What are you proposing that governments actually do to accommodate it, given the uncertainty in AVs? I didn't actually say that I thought that they weren't willing to accommodate them. Mm -hmm. um, what I've seen, I've just actually, um, it's been a big week for me. I finished a study for the Transportation Research Board about low-speed automated vehicles, and what I've seen is a huge jump in um, the interest in deploying them. But I think what governments need to do is that they need to start by understanding what, um, what the technology is and focus on um, what the kinds of questions are about the safe operations of these, these sets of vehicles. I think that um, the thing about the, the beta and the VHS is that um, you don't have to choose between them um, at this point. The, what you have to find as a way to take advantage and future-proof that your, your investments in them. So one of the differences with AVs is that their software is, is the key component of it, and they're con it's continually updated. So it's like you get to replace your VHS um, system with you know, CDs and then with laser and then with live streaming. Um, as you as you go along, sure, but the the legislative side is very simple, right? What we're talking about here, and what we're looking at, I should say, it's all we're talking about. What we're looking at is street design, right? And that can vary, and that takes time, and that's expensive, and a lot of times there's right of way acquisition or negotiations that have to happen. So, is there a suggestion that governments do more towards that at this point versus just kind of defining the box? Do you want to say something, Rex? Yeah, the, I think it's I think it's important to note that when we're when we're talking about designing streets and designing cities. The tendency is it's sort of like in warfare. You, you're sort of planning for the last war. And when you're looking at street design, you need to be thinking about what is coming and how soon it may be coming. And I think there's been a, a lot of hype around autonomous vehicles, but I also think that they are getting pretty close to being able to do a lot more. Uh, but uh, it is going to be a very disruptive process. For example, when you get to the point where an autonomous vehicle's price falls around the price of a bus ticket, you're going to destroy that whole mass transit because everybody's going to want it to pick them up their house and drop them wherever they're going. So we have to figure out what, what the smart models are we can do to get people to share these vehicles. Otherwise, congestion in our cities is just going to go through the roof because everybody, instead of being in any kind of mass transit, they're going to be riding by themselves. So <coughs> uh, uh, I think a, w there is a social sort of an aspect to this. There's a lot of different kinds of challenges. But if, if you could have situations where you have, for example, platoon lanes for these vehicles and things like that, you really could start to get at some of that. And um, the, the real problem is coexistence, because these conventional vehicles are going to be out there for a long time. I want to turn your question around. I, so I'm someone who started her career working for the Texas Highway Commission. So I you know, absolutely get the sort of fixed infrastructure component of it. But what I would say is also um, think of the movement to autonomy, even at the lower stages, as an opportunity for creating the opportunity to redesign the streets. Because 
without ever getting to something that's driverless, you can get greater capacity and you can get safety benefits on the streets. And we're already seeing these smaller types of things. And so it may be that it's the issue of sort of what can you do now and use all this sort of um, you know, tactical urbanism uh, ways to sort of try to move in that direction as, as you go forward in terms of flexibility. Uh, so maybe more specific to your question around regulation, this might um, get to some of what you're asking. So I've been really encouraged over the past year with the discussion around scooters. I've noticed, you know, like I feel like the first wave was like ride hailing and a lot of communities it was just kind of, they were kind of inundated and then this technology was something that we were, it was gonna to happen to us that we didn't have much control over it. And I think with scooters, you know, folks in, have learned their lesson with ride hailing and have been pretty sophisticated with doing pilot projects and kind of asking for data and other types of metrics and thinking through how they want the system to function, and then testing it for a period of time, measuring it, and then kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, using what they learn to then formalize it with local regulation in terms of, you know, for the example for scooters, you know, where they can operate, um, maybe controlling just, you know, for example, uh, in Santa Monica, you know, they allow about a third of the scooters to be for each company that has a permit to be operating in kind of their downtown area. But the other two thirds have to be distributed outside of that core area. So they have more equity of access in terms of other areas so they can get the kind of outcomes that they want. Um, and so in terms of putting that in place, just by example, one of the things we're doing with a lot of communities we're working with is going through um, what we're calling kind of like change management thinking and saying, okay, you have this new technology and let's put scooters aside. Maybe it's an e-moped service. You know, we give them different types of things. And regardless of whatever the technology fill in the blank is, how are you going to permit that when someone comes to um, operate in your community? And so they start thinking through, uh, you know, is it public works, is there, is it the, the parking department? They start thinking through who does the management of either a contract or a permit program, uh, who plans for it, what kind of data we're getting, uh, who does enforcement. Like all of those things need to go into thinking about not just scooters, but AVs or delivery or other things. And so you're kind of future proofing, getting ready for the kind of technology that we may not even be thinking about. Uh, I work for Lodiger Industries. We design and supply automated car parking systems. Mm -hmm. um, we actually delivered the largest uh, public automated car park in Europe, which is in Denmark. Um, obviously, with the advent of autonomous vehicles, uh, we expect the number of cars on the streets to go down. But uh, I can envisage a future where autonomous vehicles are kind of seamlessly interacting with automated car parks. Uh, I don't know if that's something that you've thought about at all or yes. what you think parking requirements are going to look like in the future when we have autonomous vehicles. It's a really good question because if you look at today's cities, we dedicate an enormous amount of land uh, to parking. Uh, in the, in, just in the downtown core of, of, of Denver, Colorado, there's 237 acres just for surface parking and for not even counting the street side parking. And, uh, and that's like, if you're a city, it's like, here's this land bank that you may get at some point when you don't have your cars parked all the time. Now, if you look at the use of a, of a vehicle today, 95% of the time, a personally owned vehicle is parked, according to a number of studies. Maybe you see as, much, as little as 93 and as much as 96, but it's an enormous amount of time. If I were the CFO of a big company and I went and said, hey, there's this new thing that we're going to buy. It's really cool, and we're going to buy one for everybody, and by the, side, by the way, we're only going to use it 5% of the time. That's the American model for car ownership right there. 
And so we, we really need to start thinking through the changes that are going to come. Uh, the, these vehicles are going to move from one person to another, picking up at people and, and dropping them off, hopefully in shared vehicles to some degree. And, but the, the result of that is, instead of needing all these cars, you're going to need far fewer cars. People say, oh, well, that'll really reduce traffic. Well, it doesn't reduce traffic if they're on the road instead of parked. But it's something like one of these vehicles will replace seven personally owned vehicles. So if you look at the auto industry, they are legitimately in a panic about this. Because all of a sudden, the demand is going to drop. There are going to be jobs that are lost. It, it, is, a, it is a really complicated problem. And uh, having an automated car park, um, in this case, I'm not, I'm not clear that that really brings a great benefit. It may be somewhere for them to sleep at night. <laughs> let, me, let me make a different suggestion on that. Two, two things. One is that automated car parks use less space. Yeah. Um, and that, that's an interesting sort of application of it. And we have a long transition to go forward. And so there's a lot of opportunity. During Redesigning parking garages so that we can convert them into other structures is probably never pencils out. But um, being able to put in the technology that allows you to put more vehicles on less space is probably good. But my other challenge to you is like so many other industries, my own now included with architecture and engineering, is that we're, it, it, it blows up what we're doing and how we think about it, what we're doing, you know, how we work. And so I've worked with parking companies who are now investing in fleet management to manage these fleets or, you know, and I've worked with um, my, the most interesting one was a AAA of Southern California who, or Northern California, who realized that theirs is a dying business model. Their average age of their um, member is 65 years, and they are the largest declining group of people who no longer drive. Um, it's not a viable sort of mechanism. So you've got this sort of imagination of the reapplication, mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then what's your next business plan? Yeah, I mean, w one thought process that I've had is the ability to pack the cars into smaller spaces mm -hmm. means that you could potentially have very small, dense car parks where autonomous vehicles are ready and waiting for their next right. job. Because I imagine people are going to want the car to be there quickly, just like you expect an Uber there in But two, autonomous three vehicles now. may operate more if, if they're in, in a, a driving service, like essentially mm -hmm. an Uber or Lyft, maybe like a Pez dispenser. You know, where the one goes out the front and everybody pulls up and another one goes out the front. Right. So they, they may already, the plans are that they'll already be pretty tightly spaced as they operate. Okay. This has been terrific. I know that um, I'll be here to continue the conversation afterwards, and I'm sure colleagues will as well. Absolutely. Give it up for these great guys. <laughs>